Hi folks, John Cordisco back again from Cordisco's Chess Center in upstate New York in Binghamton for a game that I normally don't cover my analytical skills. I'm only a, just under a 1600 rated player, so I'm going to give it a shot today. It's a game that was played today in the Renova Group Grand Prix. And that's the series of tournament or tournaments that's going to happen to determine the next World Championship challenger. Uh, speaking of World Championships, later this year you're going to see the current World Champion Vichy Anand defend his title against the kid from Norway, Magnus Carlsen. That's going to be really interesting. And uh, I'll tell you the truth, this game is played between a Carl Nakamura as white and Anish Giri as black. I like Anish, but I'll tell you the truth, I'm a big Carl fan. I always have been for quite a few years. He's one of those guys, he's like Carlson. Uh, he just tells it like it is. For pro and not, uh, he's pretty critical on himself, just like uh, Carlson is. I've seen some mistakes that Carl and Magnus Carlson have made, and these guys are brutal on themselves. And anybody that can be that honest about themselves, you got to admire. Uh, I'd like to see a Carl get in the, the uh, finals and fight for the world championship. Part of it because I'm American and part of it because I think a Carl deserves it. I like to see it happen. Uh, it'd be a huge shot in the arm for chess here in the United States. Well enough of my soapbox preaching. A Carl had white and Anish had black. Carl went d4. It's gonna be a pogo Indian. I'll go for the first the first few moves for you here. The bishop check. I like that move. It Develops a piece and at the same time, in essence, picks up a tempo. What I call a partial tempo. Bishop takes, the queen knight takes, and d6. Very important move here, d6. This square here, e5. White had total control over it with his pawn here and his knight here on this square. Black had to take some kind of control over that center square. As we all know, the center squares are key to any chess game. Whoever controls the center usually controls the game and wins it. Now, Carl went g3. Black castles. Carl Fionkettles is bishop. Anish goes rook to e8. And white castles, of course. e5. And then e4. Getting that pawn right up there to control these squares. He has this square controlled twice. The pawn controls this square. As we all know, central control again is key. I ran this game through my Fritz 13 engine. Not a really in-depth analysis, but a pretty good one. And instead of 9e4, it suggests this series of moves. After 85. E takes D, knight takes D, C5, knight to E2. Now, when I looked at that, I didn't like that at all. For one simple reason is this D pawn is so backward. And white has this this square here covered by both his pawns. I really didn't care for that. I can see why Anish didn't go that way. He went A5. White went C2. Knight to a6, I thought was an interesting move. I guess the thinking was, instead of going here with the knight, and then here, or even here, and the pawn would kick it, putting the knight on a6, in my opinion anyway, looks like he's going to play c5 here in the future. Queen to c3. He takes, knight takes. Knight to c5. Now, as we can see, he's starting to gang up on the c pawn a little bit. So Carl went f rook to e1. Black went c6. He's going right after the center. He's going to challenge white center. He has to. Uh, he'll just be too cramped if he doesn't. He's going after this square here. He's going to try to do some trades of the pawns so white can uh, break his hold on the center for white. The car went b3. Bishop to d7. Now, I wouldn't have the patience that these guys have. Of course, they're world-class players, and I'm not. I would probably go push the pawn right away to uh, d5 for black, but that's just me. 
H3. According to the computer, it covers the G4 square. I guess what the White was afraid of that Black would go knight to G4 and then hop his knight back over here. H6. Now I'm looking at the computer here and it says White has a very has an active position, and I tend to agree. He's got good center control, and then at D2, it's doing it's doing an okay job. But it, it, once he goes F4 in the future, he can bring this knight over to here, and he's got a pretty good game. Okay, sorry the little small blip there, a little edit in the video. After Black's H6, White is a very active position. And this was an interesting move, I thought. And it even says the computer even says it, which you can't see. Uh, two reasons why I don't show the computer much. One is I like to have people that watch these videos, even though we are amateurs, which is the vast majority of the world are amateurs. You get to pause the video and try to figure out what the Grandmaster's next move is on some of these uh, videos. And I think that's very helpful. Right now it shows... Hakaro moved rook to e3, which I thought was a fascinating move. I never would have saw that. And right now the position's about even. It's just amazing to me how these guys find the computer rooms. It's how good they are. I believe currently Hakaro is number nine in the world. I know Honest Gary's in the top 25, and that's plenty strong enough. That's well above 2,700. Black goes queen to c7. We're going to see some maneuvering here. Uh, rook a to e1. He's doubling up on the e file. It looks like a Carl's, or excuse me, Honest is going to do the same. And there's the f4 move. Uh, I wouldn't expect anything less from a Carl. He's an exciting player. Uh, sometimes he just takes risks. He likes to be aggressive. And that's the kind of chess maybe the Grandmasters shy away from. But for us fans, it's, it's great stuff. f4. It's just start right, running right through. And he doubles up his rooks. And a3. h5. That's an interesting move. Knight to c2. And bishop to c8. That bishop to c8 move, I really don't understand. Um, I guess it would take a better player than myself to figure out why that move is there. Computer has suggested though instead of bishop to c8 is to go h4 and then to go g4 and it shows the position is equal. Uh, as we all know, Carl's an exciting player. Any imbalance or any odd positions, this guy can be deadly and many times is. Wait one b4, a takes. A takes knight to e6. Now, I think a failure of Anish at this point, the computer says black has a cramped position, and he does. I mean, all of his pieces are on the third rank or behind, whereas Akaro's are on the fourth rank, and he controls all kinds of squares. His pawns control this square, this square, this square, this square, this square, this square, and this square. Talk about central control. Now his knights are a little bit back, but that won't be for long. And he's got this bishop coming right down to shoot here. I like Carl's position very much. Now the computer shows it is just a slight advantage for white, a half a pawn. But i got to be honest with you, uh, if I looked at this position for the first time, I would take a Carl's position in a second. Reason being that he's got a lot more room. And on top of that, I think his position is a lot easier to play. Now the computer suggested instead of knight to e6 for black, knight to a4 hitting the queen and then queen to d4. That's an interesting choice. After black's knight to e6, the car won rook to f1. Now it's interesting. 
This rook here was the rook that was originally on f1, and this rook here came from a1, but now he's on this rook's old spot here. Now there, the computer is showing an interesting move. It has an exclamation point and a question mark, which means interesting. Not necessarily good, but interesting would be c5 for white, and the sequence would go d takes, b takes. It gives them an isolated pawn, but I don't know if I like that very much. You get a lot of live up a lot of central control. After rook to f1, Anish went b6. He's just trying to keep control over these center squares. Knight to f3 for white. Now this was an interesting move. Knight to f8. I'm assuming he wants to either one of two things. He wants to obviously his double rooks are hitting on this pawn now. And also, I think the knight out of the way gives him more flexibility. The knight can go here or here if he has to later. And if you remember from the old Bent Larson, the old Danish Grandmaster, uh, used to say, a knight on f8, you cannot mate. Now, I must say at this point, I'm not being critical of Anish Giri, but I think what's happening in this game is Anish isn't really trying to press. I think he's just trying to hold, and which is a fancy word for saying he's trying to draw. Now, in all fairness, if I was black against a Caro, no matter how strong I was, but you've got to be a little more aggressive. And I think that's what's happening here. He's just holding a, a brick wall together, so to speak, and Carl's trying to get through it. I wish these guys would take a few more risks, but then again, it's not my name or my rating points or the money on the line either. But for us fans, I think... I think I think that Anish could have maybe pushed a little harder in this game. Carl went knight to g5, and then he went knight on f8 to h7. Interesting move, I think, would have been h4, and white goes again g4. Uh, that was the computer's suggestion. Knight takes knight. King takes knight, not knight takes knight, of course, putting the knight on the rim and in the corner, where he's the least effective. Uh, how's that old saying go? The knight on the rim is grim. Makara went queen to G d3, and he moved his king right out of the way. In fact, as we can see, the move prior to that, what the problem is, is if white moves his pawn, or excuse me, white moves this pawn to here, it's a discovered check, which is going to lose the knight. King to g8, knight to d4. He's trying to bring his pieces up. He's trying to go after him. You've got to play a little more aggressively like Carl's doing here. Now, computer suggests instead of knight to d4, rook to d1. And that would be met by bishop to a6, pinning the pawn here. After knight to d4, bishop to d7. And I'm looking at the computer, which you can't see, and there's a tiny, tiny, I mean, minuscule advantage for white. We might as well say the game is even. And that's really too bad here, because I think there's a lot of play in this position, given the proper moves. Rook f to e1, c5. Now we see Anish is trying to get some control on the queen side. Bishop takes, queen takes, knight to b3 hitting the queen. Queen goes back to c7. Again, I'm not criticizing Anish. I think he could play a little more aggressively. His bishop really hasn't been doing anything. His light-colored bishop has basically been doing nothing the whole game. Queen to d4. Bishop to c6. Knight to d2, which I thought was interesting. Let me go back here. I can't figure out why that move was made. Maybe get the knight out of the way. I'm not really sure. Maybe just to help reinforce the C pawn. B5. C takes. Bishop takes. Now knight to B1. Now as we all know, since they both have light squared bishops, they're both weak on the dark squares. Now... This bishop here is doing a wonderful job, I think, not only just guarding that pawn, he's also right down this diagonal. That's a powerful open diagonal now. 
Technically, there's nothing in it, but it, it controls all those squares, which hinders black's movements. Queen a7, queen takes, and the computer shows what would be inferior is if queen takes d6, knight takes e4, queen to a3, queen to d4, and he's starting to move in. He's destroyed white center, center pawns, and he's getting some control. So a card of the right thing. Rook takes. Knight to c3, bring his knight right up. As we all know, with a light squared bishop, he's weak in his dark square, so that knight's in a good spot. Bishop to c6. Now he's going after Black's d pawn. Rook to d7, guarding. Rook to d4. Rook to a8. You're going to see a lot of rook maneuvering in the next few uh, moves. Bishop to f3. Rook to a3. And king to f2. Carl's bringing his king up. Uh, probably drops the safety a little bit, but he's, he's trying to move in. He's trying to play aggressively. I think, frankly, at this point, he's trying to win this game. Not that you don't try to win always, but I think he's trying to press. And I like to see that in players. Carlson's the same way. They both have similar styles. They're always playing to win. It's like Kasparov used to do, whether he has the white or black pieces. He's always trying to win, not just equalize or draw. King f8. He's bringing in his king now. Rook to c4. I like that. You... You hit a piece, you go after a piece, you threaten a piece, you continue to, even in a somewhat static position, you still go after him. Bishop to b7, e5. Black chose not to take. He moved the knight. Now the computer has suggested what would happen if, if black took would be d takes, f takes, knight to h7, Bishop takes h5. Interesting enough, I'm looking at the computer here, even though technically white is a pawn up in that scenario, he's only up a half a pawn in score. So that's probably why maybe a car, or they want to do it that way. Okay, bishop takes, rook takes. Now I have to say, honestly, no matter how strong of a player I was, unless I was maybe one of the top three or four in the world, to have a rook pawn ending against a Karo, good luck. And uh, I think Anish, who's one of the best players in the world, I've seen a Karo down two pawns, sometimes three in a case, I think it was, and a rook pawn ending. And this guy is just brutal in rook pawn ending. So I'm sure that's going through his mind. And they go through each other's games, and they know who they're going to play ahead of time, and they, and they check these things. Rook to c8. D takes, rook takes. You wouldn't want to play F takes because that would isolate your pawn. Now, technically, there's a mate threat. So, naturally, black just moves over. And he played knight to D5, which I thought was interesting. What the computer shows is an interesting move is rook takes H5, G6, rook to B5. And to tell you the truth, that might have been a better scenario for Carl, because even later down the road, if uh, the rook checks here, forcing the king up to here, there's nothing really there, just the two rooks. The king has plenty of protection. This rook is guarding the knights, not to worry about loose pieces falling off. That might have been a better scenario. After knight to d5, rook takes, pawn takes, Rook to a5. I mean, these guys are fearless. I wouldn't want that. My knight hit like that, and then the pawn behind it. Of course, he goes rook to d8. Easy peasy. And as you can tell, of course, the king can't attack the rook because the knight's guarding that square. Rook to c5. <clears throat> Excuse me. King to f3. Uh, bring your king up. As we all know, kings are extremely powerful in the end game. I've seen uh, some studies that show the king is worth four points, higher than a bishop and a knight. 
and just below a rook. Rook to c6, king to f4. Now this might seem like a simple position to everyone because of the amount of pieces on the board, but I gotta tell you, rook pawn knight endings are incredibly complicated. It's the axiomoron of chess that the less number of pieces there are on the board, the more complicated it is. You have to be a lot more accurate with less pieces on the board. There's absolutely no room for error. With a lot of pieces on the board, you can make a couple of small inaccuracies and still be okay. In an ending like this, one slip and you're doomed. Rook to c1. Rook to a8 is getting his rook out of there. Rook to f1 check. King to g5. Rook to e1. King to f5 guarding the e-pawn. Rook to f1 check again. I think Anish maybe thought he was going to repeat. He blocked with his knight. Now currently the computer score is just about a quarter of a pawn ahead for white. It's, it's still basically even. Rook to f3. g4. h takes. h takes. Now I think most players at this point being that Akaro is the higher rated player. Anish was probably at this point looking for a draw. I think I'll call them chess manners or etiquette for lack of a better term. Anish probably, I'm not sure if he did, but he probably wanted a draw at this point. I will give Akaro this. He's going to play this out. He's going to play down to the Bear Kings if he has to, and that he got to admire about him, and I always have. It's everybody makes mistakes, even these guys. And the problem is, they're hoping that they're going to make the next to the last mistake, and their opponent's going to make the last one. That's the whole idea. Of continuing on, you certainly can't win by drawing. That's for certain. Black goes rook to f1. White plays g5. I think Carl's still pressing. You can see. All the black's pieces are in the back two ranks. Gary's just waiting for the draw. That's just my opinion. Sorry, Anish, or anybody that's or Anish fans. Uh, my opinion. Anybody disagrees with that, of course, is more than welcome to comment and below the video. King e7. Rook a7 check. King goes back. Rook to d7. G6 check. King e4. Rook d1 check. King to d5, rook to d1, king to c6, rook takes, all oh, this coming, king takes. Kakaro, to his credit, still plays on. I think at this point, I didn't watch the game on a video. I'm only guessing from watching Kakaro in past games. I think at this point, he's probably a little aggravated that uh, Anish basically just sat on his, sat on his hands and just wanted to draw. But again, that's just my opinion. Knight to g7. Knight d, excuse me, e6. Knight up. Knight. F takes. King takes. d4 check. King to f6. Threatening the g pawn. Knight to f3. Knight takes the pawn. Sacrificing the knight, of course. King takes. King to f7. And knight takes g6. Forcing a draw by material. And when I say they were going to play down the bear kings, I was close. I think this was an interesting game. I think this game was more about just the moves themselves. I think this game was about psychology. I'm just guessing. My personal opinion seeing interviews with both of these guys over time that I think Anish was just going to sit for a draw. If he saw an opening, of course, he would take it. But I think his goal from the beginning was equalize and draw, pretty much old school. I think Akaro was trying and pushing. But when your opponent at that level is just uninterested in complicating matters, then he just doesn't. And there's not much you can do about it. Well, folks, 
that ends that this video. I hope uh, my analytical skills were up to the task. Uh, I'm just a 1580 player, but I did my best here with the aid of the computer and the analysis here. Uh, please comment. I've made some comments on here concerning this game. I think uh, some people might find controversial, so please comment. Also, please subscribe. I would personally appreciate it. And like I always say, remember, folks, that if you think chess is just a game, you're not playing it right. And I hope to see all of you in the next video. Bye-bye, folks.